Let's pray. So, Father God, again, we thank you, God. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to just sit and soak up your word. Father, it's your word. I'm just communicating what you've already communicated for thousands of years. And so, Lord, I pray that you use me as a willing vessel to just communicate what is on your heart today, God. And I pray that um, as it's communicated to the audience, God, that people have hearts to receive, minds to comprehend, and ears to hear. My goodness. Um, And so we thank you again, Lord, and have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. So the last time I was up here, we started in the Gospel of John, and I concluded around verse 13, 14, if I remember correctly. So I'm just going to pick up there. I'm under the impression by what I was given last night and what I've been praying about this morning that we're going to exist somewhere between verses 14 to 28. So we're not even going to finish John chapter 1 again today. We're just going to kind of exist somewhere in the center. I'll pick up where I left off. Just to recap a couple of things, John, the Apostle John, was the only one out of all the 12 that were chosen that was with Jesus on the cross. John was the one whom Jesus loved. That's how he's referred to. Um, John was the one who rested his head on Jesus' chest during the Last Supper, which historically is, this is Resurrection Sunday technically, because this whole week was Passover week. So Thursday, this past Thursday, was the night of the Last Supper where we had our first communion. Friday morning in the wee hours, he was betrayed. He was put on a sham of a trial. He was hung on the, cro- on the cross. Around three in the afternoon, our time is when he gave up the ghost. And he was entombed before sundown, Shabbat, or Sabbath as they call it. And he was in the tomb all day yesterday. And this morning is the time in which... Mary came, both Marys, and Mary Magdalene, Mary, Mother Mary, came to the tomb expecting nothing, really. They knew he was under Roman guard. They knew there was a heavy stone in the way. They just knew they had to finish the anointment, to finish the burial process, and they just had faith enough that when they got there, they were going to be able to finish their job. But little did they know when they got there, they were going to be the first carriers of the gospel message. So historically speaking, ladies, you are the first carriers of the gospel message, the good news that our Christ is alive and he walks. So amen. Again, so when we say the word, the word, that's why if you look in your Bible, you see the word, literally the word is capitalized with a capital W. Whenever you see that, that indicates Jesus. So that's why the word has the emphasis on it. We're talking about a proper noun, literacy teacher, right? Proper noun, which gives assignment to something significant. Um, We're not talking about a general thing here. And again, the recap of the beginning of the Gospel of John, the Word, Jesus, was with God and the Word was God. So we're seeing two things happen simultaneously. We're seeing John break down the deity and the hierarchy of Jesus Christ as both creator and God, but also, too, he was also present. So this is where we get the plural Elohim, right? That's the Hebrew for the Hebrew form of God for plural, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So three in one, distinct, unique, all part of one God. And so that's why the Word was God, the Word was with God. So not only was Jesus distinct and separate in creation, he was also included in creation. Does that make sense? Kind of? Sort of? It, it's, it's a deep concept, and this is, this is a whole message within itself, the breaking down the, 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 the trinity of God, but it is something that we just want to make sure, on a, at least on a basic level, for those that are new, for those that have maybe been in the faith and it hasn't been explained in a correct way, that all are unique, distinct personalities of one God. That's the most basic way that I can say it. And so, we, so John starts there, whereas the other gospels start with... Um, the impregnation of Elizabeth and, and Zacharias for the John the Baptist. The other, another gospel starts with the baptism of Jesus, and the other gospel starts with the lineage of um, Abraham all the way to Jesus Christ. And so this is the one unique one where John just says, let's just start from here. Let's just tell you who Jesus is in his lordship before we even get into the other stuff that he did while he walked with us. And so, yeah. And the thought of Jesus, and this, that's another thing too, that as I was praying about this message, think about that. Like, pause your brain for one moment and just captive, hold that one thought captive and think about that. Jesus, as we know him, the Word was with God, the Word was God, created all things. And then, because he loves us so, because we were so lost, we were so dysfunctional as children, He stepped out of the heavenly realm. He stepped out 
of infinity and stepped into a finite timeline. He went from God to this meat prison cell for 30 years. Can you imagine, like, to step from one, to take that much of a step down, I just, how else can you feel about something that magnificent, that powerful, and not be in awe? To give up that title, that reign, that rule, to be like, man, my, my, kid has, my kids are having some issues. Or right, you know what? I'm quitting everything. I'm retiring from everything, sort of, and I'm going to step down and help them through this. Oh, and by the way, while I'm down there, they're going to hate me. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna beat me. They're going to torture me. And that's okay. I love them. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Have you, like, I'm sorry I'm having a moment here. Like, have you really, like, seriously contemplated that before? That's love, y'all. That's pure love. What did he gain from that? Nothing. Literally nothing. He just says, hey, guys, your guys are a little bit off. Here's how it should be done. You're going to kill me? All right, I love you. Ah, stuck with me. I was like stuck on that at like 11.30 last night. Um, I want to read you a little story. So in, uh, in, in my studies, as I told you last time I spoke, I dip and dive and bob and weave and go through a bunch of things to get ready. And um, this kind of illustrates this concept that I just talked about. Um, I was reading in the Blue Letter Bible, which is a fantastic resource. There's many, many Bible apps you can download, and I have a couple that I utilize for different purposes, and the Blue Letter Bible app is great for in-depth study. There's a text commentary you can jump into. Chuck Smith's one of my favorites, and I, I borrowed this from him, and he borrowed it from somebody else. So remember, the Bible says, what is freely given, we also freely give. So it's a, it's a, if you're a teacher, any teachers in the building today, right? We all borrow lesson plans, we modify, we share. That's how we all exist. So this is how I look at it too. So here we go. I'm reading scripture, not scripture. I'm reading a story that Chuck Smith was quoting from somebody else. So follow me along this journey. There was a publisher of a newspaper who declared himself an agnostic. So if you're not familiar with an agnostic, I, at one point in my life, I went from this whole phase of atheist, and then my buddy and I had a conversation one night over a couple of adult beverages, and he convinced me that I was an agnostic. An agnostic means you believe in something, some sort of God, some sort of creator, some sort of something, but you're not fully in subscription to a particular religion or a particular faith, right? You just believe that there's a God somewhere, someplace that probably put all this together. I'm not necessarily in agreement with Big Bang and all this other stuff. Or maybe some agnostic people believe in both. Who knows? The point is, the publisher of a newspaper who declared himself to be agnostic, that's, that's the setup. And yet, every year, this agnostic man and his wife, who was Christian, and the children would go to church for a Christmas Eve service and because it was Christmas Eve and the family celebration, he went yearly with them. So he was an agnostic that attended one of the big three, right? Christmas Eve, Mother's Day, and Easter. Those are like what we call the big three. Um, and they would give the, rec the, the recitations and their programs, and he would sing the carols. The kids would get involved. He would just kind of sit there while the family like worshiped and sang and were all doing their thing. But this one particular year, he decided that he wasn't going to make the annual pilgrimage to church because he saw it has an act of hypocrisy. So he decided, this year I'm not going. I'm not going to do it. I'm a hypocrite. If I go here and, and sit there in this pew while you guys are singing and praising and worshiping, I'm not doing it this year. You guys go. Go without me. He said, I do not believe in the incarnation. I do not believe that Jesus was God in the flesh, for I don't see any reason why God would have to come in the flesh. And therefore, I'm not going to be a hypocrite any longer. I'm not going to go to church with the family on Christmas. And despite all of the persuasive efforts of his wife, he could not be dissuaded from his position. And so, on Christmas Eve, he saw the family leaving in a blizzard to go to the church to celebrate the Christmas Eve program. As he sat by the fire, he got out a book and began a sort of settling into his couch, and he started reading. Before long, a little bird tried to fly into the window, attracted by the light of the fire inside. 
and suffering outside in the blizzard, this little bird started flying up against the window and beating itself against the window pane, trying to come inside. It distracted him from his reading, and he thought, well, little bird, go away, but it wouldn't. It kept trying to fly in. And so he finally decided, well, I guess I'll have to do something about it. And so he went down to the barn and opened up the door and turned on the light so that the little bird would be attracted to the light in the barn, hoping it would see the light and fly in and find shelter in the barn from the blizzard. While walking back up to the house, he found the little bird on the outside still, still trying to fly into the window. And by now it had begun to bloody itself from just flying up against a pane of glass. So he tried to show the bird that there was light on the barn and there was a place down there for it to go and to get warm and to be sheltered from the storm. And he started to get sort of annoyed and he said, shoosh, little bird. And the bird and the swing, and he began to swing at it a little bit. But the more he did it, the more frantic the little bird became in trying to fly into the glass. And he began to injure itself even more. And he found himself talking to the little bird. He said, little bird, I don't hate you. I'm trying to help you. Don't you understand, little bird? I'm your friend. I don't mean to harm. I want to help. Poor stupid little bird, don't you know? And then, he, then a thought came to his mind. Here we go. <laughs> Oh, if only I could become a bird for a moment to communicate to this poor little creature that I don't hate, that I'm trying to help it. And suddenly the light flashed. God became man because man so misunderstood God. He didn't hate man. He, was trying not to ha- he, was, he wasn't trying to harm man. He wanted to help man. And he went into the house, got his overcoat and everything, and he headed off to church to meet his family. He saw the reason for the incarnation, that God might communicate to us the truth about himself, the truth that had been lost in the garbled concepts man had created of God. Never, ever, ever discredit what God can do in a moment. God is the ultimate teacher. God is the ultimate father. And listen to me, he designed you. He knitted you in your mother's womb uniquely. There is a certain way that he can communicate with you that nobody else will understand. It can be through a song. It can be through a conversation, an interaction, a movie, a license plate, a sticker, a t-shirt. It doesn't matter. God will communicate to you, and he is trying to constantly communicate with us. It's just, do we have faith to receive it? Do we have enough faith to understand it? Can we hear his voice over all the noise of this world? Do we? Do we? And I pray that you guys understand that, and I pray that he communicates to you guys in a special and unique way today. I thought that story was great. I thought that was a wonderful little story. At first, I'm like, where is he going with this? A little bird in the window? And then he got bloody. I'm like, okay, this is getting scary. This is no Disney movie. And then all of a sudden, like, the dad's like, I, Eureka. Also, never, ever discount the power of a praying wife. (laughs) A praying wife. My wife prayed for me. For years and years and years in my nonsense, and the Lord encountered me, and so all in his time. So women, we love you. Thank you, ladies, for being the sound-minded ones at times when we're knuckleheads. Um, Let's read. Let's get into the scripture, shall we? Let's start in verse 14. The word becomes flesh. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld its his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 15. John bore witness of him. This is um, not John the Apostle, this is John the Baptist. Okay, I know we're talking, I know we're in the Gospel of John, and he's talking about John, so it could get a little confusing, but here particularly, he's talking about John the Baptist. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And all of his fullness we have received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I'm really going to hammer home on this particular verse in a moment. So if you want to highlight verse 17, that's a great one to highlight. I'll come back to that. Um, 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Now, This is the testimony of John, John the Baptist. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed, and he did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, 
what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Like 20 questions, bro. Like, like come on, man, leave me alone. Let me do my job. Uh, and then they said to him, who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness to make straight the way of the Lord. As the prophet Isaiah said, and now those who were with us, sorry, those who were sent were from the Pharisees. And they asked him saying, why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to, worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethabara beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. Stop there for a moment. So right there, we see John the Baptist. Now we talked a little bit last time I spoke about John the Baptist being the first influencer. And we talked about what influences us, our family, our culture, our jobs, yada, 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 yada. But also too, John the Baptist was also a pioneer. And it's kind of funny how this, this came up in conversation with my two oldest last night. Um, the word pioneer, well, what is a pioneer? A pioneer is a trailblazer. A pioneer has an idea and has the faith to follow through. A pioneer makes a path where there isn't one. And this is John the Baptist. Now, the world labeled him Crazy John. If you ever watched the Chosen TV show, he's out in the jungle. He doesn't shower. He's all disheveled. He's got locust fur and he's eating honey and or he's eating locusts, right? Camel fur. And he's eating locusts and he's eating honey and he's just out there just baptizing because John knew the spirit was moving in him. John knew his mission was to make a way to start the path for Christ to follow. He knew he wasn't the one. He knew he was never going to be the one. And he knew he had an important job to do. And I don't doubt the fact that when he started stepping into his authority, he saw how people reacted and he saw he was going to be an outcast. And guess what? Guess what he did? He pursued it. That's a pioneer, right? I, I, the first thing I think of Lewis and Clark, if you don't know who Lewis and Clark were, man, that must have been a heck of a journey. But like they made a road where there wasn't one, right? Psychojuia had a lot to do with that. But we're, we're, we're looking at some people who just don't mind doing the hard things, especially when the glory comes nothing of them. They're glorifying the one who sent. And this is John the Baptist. He knew what he was going to do was going to be difficult. He knew what he was going to do was, was going to alienate him. He knew what he was going to do was probably going to get him killed or imprisoned or beaten. But he did it anyway, and he did it for zero glory because he knew Jesus was coming, and he believed it. They're first cousins after all, right? And he knew this, and he stuck with it. And so that's just an amazing thing. Um, again, John the Baptist was Jesus' older cousin by birth. And so when we look at this, um, dwelt among us the glory. John bore witness to him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. In verse 15, this is John understanding who his fleshly first cousin, who by earth standards is six months younger, roughly. We don't know exactly. They didn't keep birth certificates back then. But we do know that Elizabeth was further along in her pregnancy with John the Baptist when Mary came in. And remember, in, in Scripture, we see that, that John the Baptist leapt, was jumping for joy inside the womb of Elizabeth when Mary came in the room. And so even though by earthly standards, John the Baptist is less than a year older than Jesus, he understands who Jesus is. This is he who has come before me, right? He knows that even though this man meat suit again, is, is a person that we can see, he understands who this person truly is. And so this is what, this is what he's saying when he recognizes him in that moment. And um, yeah, he acknowledges Jesus' eternal authority by coming before me, as he states. Let's look at verse 17. This is the one I told you to highlight, and this is, this is a huge, huge sticking point. Uh, this is a fundamental difference um, between Christianity, modern-day Christianity, post-Acts church versus pre-arrival Jesus of the Jewish faith, right? This is, the, this is the fundamental difference between living under law and living under grace, okay? I'm not going to—again, this is a whole sermon within itself. This is a very 
in-depth concept. I'm just going to kind of glaze over it so people can understand on a, on a surface level what the difference between the two are. So Jesus, the blood of Jesus sets us free. The blood of Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. We know this. This is why we take communion. But let's go back in time a little bit, shall we? Moses, the liberator, right? In Exodus, Moses came and freed, freed the Israelite people from the oppression of the Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And then once they were free, he was given law. We call him the Mosaic law. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's things. You know, all of these Mosaic laws that we understand. And these were rules and principles. And if you go through numbers and if you go through all these um, post-Exodus Old Testament books, there are chapters upon chapters upon chapters about laws on sacrifices, fellowship offerings, communion offerings, meal offerings, concentration, consecration offerings, burnt offerings, peace offerings, sin offerings. Here's how you cut this. Here's what animal you use. Here's what you do with the blood. Here's what you do with the entrails. Here's what you do with the meat. Here's what you place it here. Here's what you do it there. There was all these specific things placed upon the Israelite people. What was the goal of it? What was the purpose of it? It was so they could have fellowship with God because they were disobedient, right? They needed rules, structure, and regulations to keep them in check. So they tried by their own strength to live up to all these laws and standards. I believe there was like, like six, isn't there like 600 and something laws? And, and, and they have, to, like, who can live up to that, right? There are laws in place that they felt they had to come underneath and, and for a time, that was true. That's why Moses was given these laws. So they could try to attain communion with God since the fall of man in the garden. Okay? And so this led to the corruption of man to enter in. Right? We have the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin and Caiaphas, who was the head priest of the Sanhedrin, and all these people that were kind of turning and using and weaponizing in sort of a way uh, the laws and standards of God. And they were also hypocritical. They were also power hungry. And, they, and we saw this later during Passover week when Jesus came to Jerusalem. I remember he was flipping tables. He's like, you turned my, my father's house into a den of thieves, right? He was calling out the hypocrisy because guess what, guys? Can I, can I give you something? Can I offer you something? You can never, ever on your own live up to these laws. It's impossible. Paul talks about this in Romans. Because of the blood of Christ, how do you know what's wrong? How do you know the expectation if it's not set before you? Right? How do you know something's illegal unless somebody says, hey man, before you go out in the world, don't do this, 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 and this, because that'll get you thrown in jail. Oh, sweet. Thanks for telling me. I probably would have done half of those things just because it looks fun. Right? Unless you know, you're ignorant to it. Okay? And so... Now, because Jesus, we live under grace. Grace. Because we know that we can never live up to those laws and standards on our own. We need a Savior. We were all condemned. Think about it. There's this one guy, some of you may be familiar with him. He's like an Australian guy, I think. And he, he goes around and he interviews people on the street and he just kind of like talks to them about God. In a very simple way, he says, let me ask you something. Have you ever told a lie, even a little lie in your life? Yeah, okay. Have you ever taken anything that wasn't yours, whether it was a penny or a pencil or something like that? Yeah. Have you ever used God's name as a curse word? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Have you ever told your parents no and disobeyed them? Yeah. Have you ever, um, checking the audience, okay, well, I'll skip that one. All right, and so, so he said, okay, so basically what you're saying is you're a lying, stealing, uh, disobedient, um, troublemaker, whatever he said. Like he said in a very aggressive way, and he says, if these were the laws that you were being judged by, are you guilty or innocent? Guilty right? And so he, in a very basic way, he kind of highlights the fact that even though you may have taken a nickel when you were three, even though as a two-year-old, your mom may have said, sweetheart, come over here and wash your hands. No, mommy, I'm playing Legos, 
right? Is the heart disobedient in that moment? No, but by the, by the rules and standards of God, by these laws that were given, we can never live up to them, ever, right? And so this is why Jesus had to come. This is why Jesus is our Savior. When he died, all these offerings, all these sacrifices, all these rituals, all these things were done. Why did they have animal sacrifices in the first place? It all goes back to the garden. Remember, Adam and Eve, when they first tasted of the fruit, they realized they were what? Naked. And so what did they do? They fashioned clothing and they hid. And God said, Adam, where are you? Here, Lord, what are you doing? I was hiding. Why? Because I, I was naked. I was embarrassed. Who told, you, who told you that? Right? God knew right away. And so what happened? The first sacrifice happened in the garden. They sacrificed an animal and they were clothed in fur. This is why the Old Testament Israelites were sacrificing animals, because guess what? The blood covered up the sin. It just covered it. It didn't deal with it. We needed a pure sacrifice, the pure blood of Christ, to cleanse sin once and for all. Once Jesus came, remember, Jesus wasn't born by mortal man. His bloodline was unlike any other. So when his blood bled out on the cross, that blood, once and for all, cleansed mankind of sin. Once and for all. Now, we don't have to do all of these things. We don't have to. We are under grace. The blood of Christ has set us free. All we have to do is freely receive what has already been done. And this is what John the Baptist is trying to communicate to people. I'm just baptizing. I'm making the way. I'm getting people ready because he knows the lamb is coming. He knows things are about to shift. And so this is what I mean when he's a pioneer because this is a concept that was completely foreign to people. They knew the Messiah was one day coming, but John knew he was coming now. That's a lot. That's a lot. I'm only in like three verses. Sit tight. No, I'm just kidding. We're going to go quick. Um, but I just really wanted you to understand the difference between ritual, law, and the covering of sin versus grace that we're under now, the forgiveness, complete forgiveness of sin. We just have to receive it. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, indeed. In verse 18, excuse me, um, no one has seen God at any time, only the begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father. He has declared him. Some of you may say, well, that's not entirely true. Moses saw God, but he didn't really see. He saw the vapor of him, right? He saw the after trail of him. Anybody that would behold the presence of God in this state, not in our glorified bodies, would drop dead like that. But he's, he's alluding to the fact that this is a person, Jesus Christ, when he comes, he is the one who has beheld God and been face to face with him, again, nodding to his deity, nodding to his, his, his lordship in heavenly realm. And he's just kind of reminding people that he is the savior, he is the Messiah, he is the Christ, and he has been where we have never been and where we can never understand him to be. Um, now, a lot is made about these questions. Are you the Christ? No. Are you Elijah? No. Because Old Testament shows us that Elijah will be the one that comes and makes the way. And so this is why these Pharisees were asking these specific questions. Because remember, there was the Israelite people, right? I'm just going to, for those that don't know, it was the Israelite people. And then you had the rabbis who were, um, who were the teachers, right? They would communicate law. They would do all the stuff. And these were called the teachers, the rabbis. And they had the Pharisees who were called the teachers of the teachers, Okay, the Pharisees were kind of a step above, and they were kind of the governing body of the Israelite people. And amongst the Pharisees, there was another, another group that was a tier above. This group was called the Sanhedrin. Okay, These were the, this was the ultimate governing authority over the Israelite people. And there was one in charge of the Sanhedrin at this time of Christ. His name was Caiaphas. And Caiaphas was the one who had a personal vendetta against Jesus, and he was the one who spearheaded the crucifixion. And so when, when John the Baptist is baptizing people and the Pharisees came out to see him, they said, who are you? 
why are you doing this? Who, under whose authority are you doing this? Are you the Christ? No. So he knew who he was talking to. John the Baptist knew exactly who he was talking to. Like, this isn't just some random guy from the streets that just heard something. Like, these are people who have some authority in the community. Like, are you Elijah? No, I'm not. But I am making the way. So the emphasis here, even though John the Baptist does not claim to be Elijah as it was prophesied, he is operating with the spirit and power of Elijah. And this is what we're nodding to. It's, it's, it's referenced, referenced in Matthew 17, when Jesus said about John the Baptist, this is Elijah if you are able to receive it. So by John the Baptist answering no to the question if he's Elijah or not, it shows that he is not the full fulfillment of the prophecy of Elijah, but he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. And in Luke 1, we see again when the angel Gabriel appeared before Zacharias, John's father, before Elizabeth was with John the Baptist, he said to him, he, John the Baptist, will go forth in the spirit and power of Elijah. So this was spoken over him even before he was born. So he is on a mission. He is given the full authority and power to do these things to make way for Jesus. And so John, the apostle, is really spending a ton of time, as I am, focusing on preparing hearts to receive this concept. If you don't understand these things, if you cannot, at least in a basic way, understand and, and communicate these things to people, how can you communicate who Jesus is? Right? You have to understand these things. And so, again, this is why the Gospel of John is a great place to start. It makes full sense. Um, yeah, I'm almost done. <laughs> um, a couple more minutes and I'll get the worship team up here. Not yet, though. I'll call you guys up in just a second. Um, John knew his purpose. I'm looking at specifically highlighting verses 22 through 28. Um, John knew his purpose. He knew who he was. He knew what his mission was. And most importantly, he knew who he wasn't. He knew who he wasn't. He knew that Jesus was coming. He knew he wasn't the Messiah. He knew he wasn't Elijah. He knew he wasn't the prophet. He knew all these things, and he made sure to never take the glory. And guess what? After Jesus came and after Jesus was baptized, some of John's followers said, hey, teacher, this guy over here, he's starting to get his own crew together. And he says, yeah, go follow him. It's time for him to increase and for me to decrease. There's no pride there. John got it. This is a humble servant's heart. I didn't prepare this, but the Lord is leading me here. This is what it means to be a humble servant. This is what it means to make sure the glory goes to the proper place. It's never about us. I'm standing here on stage talking to you, but do you, th this doesn't make me any more important than you. I have, no, I have no perks waiting for me anywhere else. Matter of fact, there's more judgment on me than there is for you. But all glory go to him. All glory go to him. We have to make sure that whatever good comes, whatever souls are saved, whatever light is brought to a dark place, that it always points back to our Lord and Savior. We are just carriers of the light. Simple, plain, but it takes a humble heart to not desire all the fruits that come with being in elevated positions. There's also a lot of work as well. And John knows about that, right? My goodness, that poor guy. Um, I already talked about him being a pioneer and being called crazy, but what an honor, right? That's a good question. I had this thought. What if, you don't have to answer this. You can just answer it in your own head. What if the Lord presented you with an opportunity to do what John did? What if you were given an opportunity to make way, to do something so important, not only historically, but spiritually, to literally pave a path for the one, but your reward would be everything that he got? 
how many of us would be like, yeah, right? <laughs> like, let's go. I pray that we would. But this is something that John knew. And he did it. And he knew. And he did it. And he knew. And he did it. Right? This is crazy in a good way. When I, sometimes when I say crazy, I don't mean insane. I mean like powerful, magnificent. Um, I will now invite the worship team back up. Um, we are winding down. At the end of 28, Jesus comes. Jesus shows up. The one whose sandal straps that John is not worthy to loose. Jesus comes, and what does he say? I'm just going to go ahead a little bit ahead of me. I'm going to go to verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, And after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. So even in that moment, John saw Jesus coming. Behold, the Lamb of God. Not, behold, guys, hey, there's my cousin. There's the guy I know. No, this is the Lamb of God. Right there, he understood. It's not about titles or about things. It's like, well, it is about that title, but it's not about the earthly things that we associate. But this is my buddy. This is my coworker. This is my teammate. This is my whatever. This is the Lamb of God. There he is right there. That's him. People are like, this guy? This carpenter from Nazareth? Like, this is the guy we're talking about? Like, this is him? That's him, right? That's him. And what a tremendous statement concerning Jesus. The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. How did the Lamb of God, Jesus, remove the sin? By his sacrificial substitutionary death. His blood was unlike any other, unique, untainted by sin. His love is far greater than anything we can even fathom, right? When we say the word love, I love my wife. I love my children. I love my country. I love chocolate chip cookies. I love cheeseburgers. I love the Miami Dolphins. Hey, there's forgiveness in his kingdom. There's forgiveness in his kingdom. But, but do you understand what I'm saying? Love. Are those loves equivalent? I hope not. Should I love chocolate chip cookies in the way that I love my wife? No. Right, so we, by English definition, understand the word love similarly, but it has different degrees of importance based upon what we attribute it to, right? In the Greek, they had three ways to say the word love. They had phileo, phileo love, which is brotherly love, which is why the city of Philadelphia, Philadelphia is called the city of brotherly love. That's phileo love. That's the love I have for my friends, my brothers, my sisters, right? There's eros love, which again, because our audience is multi-age, that's a husband and wife kind of love. I'll leave it there. And uh, we have agape love, the love of God, Christ's love for us. It's a love that would be disrespected if we tried to put a worldly definition on it. It is a love that surpasses all understanding of love. It's a love that God has for each and every single person, whether you receive that gift of grace or not, whether you blaspheme his name or put him up high, that love still exists for every person the most obedient, and the most lost. It is a love that was nailed to a cross and said, forgive them. It is a love that went to the cross willingly. It is a love that endured torture, ridicule, 
It was a love that was so infectious that 12 other men gave up everything they had, and women too, to carry this message and be cast out, to be stripped of everything, to go to their deaths, their executions, rejoicing. It's that kind of love. It's that kind of love. That's for all of us. That's who Jesus is. Not who he was, who he is today. Today. We say, oh, I love that song. I love my children. But again, this is a different kind of love. And this is the love that was poured out for you, for me, for everybody. What else can you say? But thank you. Amen. 